And welcome, everyone. I'm Bill Newell. We're joined right now by Phil Stacy, Matt Williams, Nick Giannino. Nick Kukuru will be joining us here in just a few moments, we uh, we believe. And we're here talking about some high school football from this past weekend, heading ahead to uh, next weekend as well. So, uh, Phil and uh, Matt and the company, uh, let me just ask you, is is Marblehead the top team on the North Shore right now, uh, other than, uh, you know, at least in the Northeastern Conference? What are you what are you guys thinking? I mean, through two weeks, they, they've looked good. Um, top team in the conference. I mean, I guess you'd have to say so, considering they beat Beverly, who beat Danvers. Um, you know, PBD was down, what, 20 nothing at halftime, Willie, and then came back and made it a game. Uh, uh, Maskinomets only played the one game. Lost his 2-0, and but I think... Uh, that would not uh, work out well in their favor if they played Marblehead. So, yeah, I think it's fair to say that Marblehead is probably top in the Northeastern Conference. Although, you know, uh, Willie and I were talking during the past week and saying, uh, you know, we think that Bishop Fenwick could play with any team in the conference this year. Yeah, they are uh, in the conference, but, you know. Well, they they uh, handled Drakeit, and when I saw Drakeit on their schedule, Drakeit's had a great program over the years and been mm -hmm. very tough. And that that what was that forty two to six or something like that? Um, I don't know. Forty five six, yeah. Yeah. So uh, it was a crooked number. I just got the wrong number, I guess. But yeah. Yeah, all kinds of athletes at Fenwick. Uh, I think what really makes them difficult to stop is how dynamic that offense is not only do they have a lot of skilled players but they run around they run a lot of uh misdirection and, and i don't want to call them trick plays but it's like those rpos that you know a shovel play that's like a quick pass you know a, a two foot pass that uh you know you get somebody uh, running through the line and they just kind of the quarterback just kind of shovels it to them quickly while they're in motion it makes it awfully difficult for defenses to stop. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone can pick up on that, but let me just throw uh, St. John's Prep into the mix as well. They lost in uh, in the double overtime, what, to BC High over the weekend as well. Uh, you know, Catholic Conference, league underway. Certainly uh, an, an exciting game there over at St. John's. I'm guessing the prep improved quite a bit from their opener against uh, St. Mary's where they won, but I don't want to say they were going through the motions, but I don't think they had to expend a lot of energy that they normally would in Catholic Conference. But against BC High, you know, a team with a much bigger line, a lot more experience than they had. Um, you know, they were leading that game with a minute to go, and uh, BC High tied it up, forced overtime, and that's where the prep fell, but I think they probably learned some things about themselves, what they need to do to get better. Um, they're scheduled by Catholic Memorial on the road Saturday. I say scheduled because Catholic Memorial didn't have a game last week, and we don't know what the status is this week. But uh, that'll be a huge test for the Eagles, who have um, you know lost to uh, Catholic Memorial in the regular season and only in the playoffs the last two years. So. Uh, there's no playoffs this year. Uh, well, at least there's no state playoffs, I should say. There's a Catholic Conference playoffs. But, um, you know, the Eagles are really going to have to rise up and, and bring their best uh, to West Roxbury to beat uh, this team that's very hungry to defeat them. Let me let me just drive one more question here directed at you, Matt, uh, and that would be Peabody. Uh, as, as Phil just mentioned, played Marblehead tough uh, last weekend. That was a close score. And uh, so where does Peabody fit into the mix here? Uh, we'll see. I mean, tail of two halves, right? I think um, defensively, they got off the field a lot. I mean, Marblehead's parents were not happy that uh, Coach Redloff has skewed field goals on probably three trips inside the red zone. And, you know, you tack on six or nine points and maybe that game looks a little bit different and obviously Marblehead had a freshman kicker and you know Jim's a guy that's going to go for the end zone most times anyway I mean this isn't the NFL right the parents want you to kick it like you got uh, Adam Vinatieri out there and that's just not how it works so um, you know kudos to PBD's defense for holding tough I mean I think you know there's been a sea change in their attitude right I think last year most of the time 
those kind of trips inside the red zone ended up in the end zone, right? So you get off the field, you get a long touchdown catch, you get some energy, and and then you get going. Um, but you know, being close isn't good enough, right? They got they got there's no easy games in this league. Uh, they got to play Masco next. And if, you know, you, you could play tough and lose to Masco, then you're 0-2. Danvers, same thing. Uh, Beverly after that. So, you know, there's no brownie points for, for playing good, right? Like, this is a team that hasn't beaten a current member of the NEC North since, I think, week seven of 2018, right? So, at some point, you have to win a game. Um, they certainly look like they have great pieces in place. They, they have a, a, a big play threat on offense in, in Brandon Pazeni the senior speedster, uh, you know, they haven't had a vertical threat. Uh, I don't think like him since coach Bettencourt has been there and that's eight years now. Right. So that changes your offense quite a bit. It, it allows you to take chances. Um, you know, every single third and long, you're not buried, you're not doomed to punt, right. You can pick up some, some third and longs and stuff. So they certainly look like a team that is a lot better than I anticipated coming into the season. Uh, but having said that, they can't be putting the cart before the horse. I mean, they got to put a, together some wins. Uh, you know, just playing tough and losing does not really, you know, get anything. Get anything to speak. So we'll see what happens this week against Masco. I mean, that Masco right now is a team that looked like maybe the best team in the league. I mean, they, they knocked they knocked Danvers around. And Danvers, we thought, was the best team in the league, you know. So now Masco's never going to play Beverly, which I think is a real shame because you get to the end of the year. How can you determine who the best team in the league is if those two teams haven't played each other, right? And, and Masco may not be able to practice until this Thursday. So they got to put a game plan together in one day for a team that's feeling pretty good about itself, right? So this is a very unconventional season. And um, I, I, as we talk about short game planning, I'll throw it back to Phil in what we saw with Beverly and Danvers, because with only one day to prepare there, I, I think the team with the better athletes, and that's Beverly High, came out and, and played better and, and got the win. And I certainly think Beverly being angry about their performance the previous week was, was a factor in that as well, right, Phil? Yeah, I, I do want to add that uh, you said, you know, short weeks and the screwy season. All. I'm going to uh, use that as a crutch for my team uh, terrible start to the season and the predictions I'm coming off a extremely real losing week i'm already in last place in our picks and, and that's a convenient excuse for me you know it's uh <laughs> not good. But, but yeah you're right um hey phil I, bill who's in first though I, who's in first place with the picks uh uh i just i i just did them this morning it, it's, oh uh is it oops you would think you would think Nick Giannino was in first place the way he was reacting. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, ahead, I'm sorry. I'm ahead of someone. Okay, no, I think Coops is in first place. Nick, uh, like, yeah, Nick, Nick G had the best week in week two, but the best week overall so far is uh, Nick C. So it's a good time to be a Nick, I guess. They yeah, got the exactly. Nick of time. A couple of uh, junior roast peas for you guys, you know, fun size. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, uh, Beverly was a uh, – they were, they were PO'd uh, coming into that football game Saturday, uh, if I can use a crass terminology. Um, they got beaten up badly in Marblehead. They were embarrassed. They were humiliated. I think it was a uh, come-to-Jesus week for them during practice. Uh, not only from the coaching staff, but also amongst the players, which they told me after the game Saturday. Um, they made some nice tweaks to the game plan. What I thought was particularly interesting is that um, Ambus came out and moved down the field and scored in the opening series. And you think, oh, we put all this work in during the week, and now they score. It didn't seem to phase them at all. They came right back punched one in on their own, and then they started to take control. They, they controlled the line. That's what surprised me, really. I mean, over the last, I don't know, five, six, seven years, like we've really seen Danvers uh, football not only get better and better and be among the best teams in the conference, but really uh, out-tough teams a, a lot of games, winning a lot of games up front, and they most certainly did not against Pebbly. So kudos to that offensive line for Pebbly. Uh, I should say both lines for Pebbly. Doing the job there. 
now I think, uh, as Willie said, you know, you're going to have a team that was upset going against an opponent. Now Damas has a chance to do the same thing this week. They're going to be fuming. Not only after losing to Beverly, but they've lost two games now. I don't think anybody thought they'd be 0-2 to start the season. And here they have the rarity of all rarities. You get a home and home in football. So they have Beverly again this week. So they know what to plan for and prepare for and what they hope to tweak and what they want to do. And for them, I think it's uh, containing the outside. You know, they really got beat to the outside, both with Jordan Irvine runs, a couple by Jay Sean Jones. Uh, Beverly really hurt them with the pass the eight times they opened up the, the passing game. Uh, so they want to control that flow to the outside, get a little more physical between the tackles and um, keep Beverly from breaking those big plays. That's what really hurt them on Friday night. I think for Beverly, because it was a short week and there were some commonalities in the way that Maskinomit and Danvis run their offenses, maybe it wasn't as big of a switch for Beverly to prepare for Danvis as it might have been for Danvis to prepare for Beverly instead of Swampscott. So that may have played into Beverly's hands last week. I think they'll be on a little more even ground this coming week. So it'll be interesting to see, can Beverly pull off that rare in-season sweep or will Danvis hold serve and win at home, finally get that first win of the season? I, I suppose, you know, I, I forgot about them uh, because they haven't played, but I, I suppose we would have to throw Swampscott into the discussion about the best teams in the league. I mean, if they ever play again, they demolish uh, Salem. You know, they have some great athletes on offense, so – I got to think they could play with anyone uh, and Winthrop too, you know, is a team that's under the radar a little bit that, that demolished their opponent this past week. So they're a team that could potentially be a factor in those uh, cross conference power rankings, you know, at some point in the next five weeks. They had a good core before they even added already at quarterback. So yeah. that, he's going to make them even better. Yeah, I agree. They're, they're sort of laying in the weeds, but anybody that overlooks them, I think we've talked about a little bit in the podcast before, but, you know, anybody that looks at that NEC South as a walk for Swampscott, I mean, Winthrop's definitely in the mix, and, and Gloucester's playing pretty good too, Poops. I mean, only 15 guys, and uh, he managed to win the game. Uh, you know, that, that was... Uh, Shut up. That was a nice quote by the coach about uh, the old Terry Silver line that I'll take 15 Gloucester guys against... Uh, you know, a hundred guys from anywhere else. <laughs> well, that, that uh, Nick Giannino, hang on a second, but Nick Kukuru, let's go right there to, uh, to Gloucester. Mm -hmm. They're two and oh, and uh, we we're just yeah. hearing that to no surprise, it looks like their, their game against Swampscott will not be played this week because, because Swampscott had the uh, COVID mm -hmm. alert in the district and, or at the high school. So they're, I guess some sports are canceled there. So we're just seeing that on the NEC website. So that game, unfortunately, won't happen. Gloucester versus Swampscott on Friday. But uh, maybe a note on Gloucester football, now 2-0, and as, as mentioned. Yeah, I mean, two games in, they've already uh, surpassed their win total from, from 2019. So, I mean, uh, you know, they're definitely uh, taking a, a step in the right direction. Now Now's where things get difficult. I know they, they got – I know they're supposed to have Swampscott, but then they'll have, you know – Beverly, Peabody, Winthrop, and Danvers uh, in their final four games. So they got a bit of a gauntlet to run through uh, the rest of the way. But, I mean, you know, good for them. I mean, 15 guys out there, their entire JV team was, uh, you know, was in COVID protocol. I mean, they, they didn't have a kicker. Their kicker's on the JV team. They they had a, a tight end with a with a lineman jersey waiting on standby just in case, you know, somebody got hurt. Uh, and, you know, they had no subs in the defensive secondary. So, I mean, I – I don't care who you're playing. You, you, you scrape something together like that. That's pretty impressive. You know, Nick, what I thought was really impressive that they did the other day was um, they turned the entire game around. I thought not only on that uh, punt where they had the punt deep in their, um, in their own red zone and ended up uh, recovering a fumble and scoring right before the half. But before that, when they went for it on fourth and short at midfield, uh, with about two and a half minutes to go until halftime, scoreless game, and they convert uh, not only the first down, but they end up scoring a, what, 52-yard touchdown or whatever. Uh, yeah. That was a huge play, and you could see the momentum just surge through the sideline. Uh, as small as that sideline was, it, it gave them an incredible shot of energy, I thought. 
Yeah, for sure. And you saw on the drive before they had a touchdown called back on, on a penalty, but right. uh, they, yeah. they really struggled on offense against Saugus. And, you know, you could kind of tell they found a little something there. Uh, they were kind of switching between the wing tee and the spread against Saugus. And Salem, uh, they were more wing tee. They've been executing a little bit better out of the wing tee, but it was nice to, you know, they had that spread when they needed it, which, you know, gave them a touchdown at the end of the half. They got their uh, big tight end and one-on-one -on -one coverage. And, you know, they threw one up to them out of the shotgun formation. So it it was good to see them kind of, you know, execute uh, in, in both ways when they needed to. And that tight end, Jared uh, uh, Dayton, I'm sorry, Del Torchio, he mm -hmm. went up and timed that perfectly. I mean, he used his body about six foot four, I assume. Mm -hmm. uh, got leverage, went up, timed it perfectly, and, and came down with the ball. I mean, that was a well executed play right there. It's a two minute drill type play. And we got to, you know, constantly say, that short practice season, short time to get ready for this and all. And he made that play like it was, you know, early November and he'd been playing for eight weeks. Yeah, and he's, he's one to watch, Jaden Del Torcho, the sophomore, and, and, and he's been kind of a wrecking ball on defense, too, at, at, at defensive end. Uh, and he's one to watch going forward, as is, you know, running back Frank DeSisto, 147 yards and a, and a couple touchdowns. So they're, they're, they're um, finding a few things, a few, uh, you know, youngsters that look like they could be, you know, have some uh, potential to be future stars. Why don't we take it up uh, Cape Ann, uh, stay in Cape Ann, but take it up Route 133 to our Ipswich correspondent, Mr. Giannino. But you're, re yeah, yeah. you're, you're reading, that. you're reading my mind. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I know how to work these things. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, them, um, I'll go ahead, Bill. No, no. You got uh, a very happy, hardworking Kevin Fassett up there at Ipswich High School with a big That's win right. last weekend That's against right. North Reading. Yeah. Yeah. Two and all. I've seen both their wins. I, I was joking with the coach after I should just go to all their games and maybe they'll keep winning. But now they look, um, they look, pretty you, know, good you know, he's also on. a JV hockey coach too, right? Nick, you could, did he? no, I did not know that you could do that in the winter. He's a JV hockey coach for Beverly High. Not a hoop guy. That's too bad. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, no, two and oh, uh, they beat two pretty solid teams, at least in, in terms of the Cal standards there with Amesbury and North Reading. Um, this past week, you know, they kind of, kind of were the same for them. They don't, they don't pass the ball much. They're a run heavy team, ground and pound. I think they threw the ball maybe once with their junior quarterback there, Aiden Arnold, but he's running the offense well, you know, doing what the coaches are asking for him and their run game is getting it done. Um, Cole Terry, I'm sure that's a familiar name for all you guys. And he's been, you know, playing pretty well for them for a few years now, but he's off to a great start. And then Chase Huntley, both games I've seen him um, rip off pretty substantial runs. I think he had a 50 yard run in a game against Amesbury. And then this past week, he, at a 65 yard touchdown run. So those two guys are uh, capable of exploding at any point and um, they're mixing up the play calling nicely to get in some really good holes from the line up front. Uh, Nikhil Walker is definitely a guy to watch. I think he's probably getting some offers now. Well, Nick G just froze on us here, so. Hopefully he'll come right back. Maybe not. Well, you is there I another? Can... can we? Is there another Nick we can tag tag in here? Yeah. <laughs> hey, How speaking. Of, let, let me. Let me. Let me. I got one other question for Nick Nick Kukuru Then while while Nick G is frozen here, how about Manchester Essex? I mean, they're they're playing this incredibly tough schedule as you were pointing out earlier. Greater Lawrence. I remember watching them in the playoffs. I don't think it was last year, but the. I mean, this is a big team, Greater Lawrence, and they lost to them. But, man, they got a tough schedule, the uh, Hornets of Manchester Essex. Yeah, I mean, they had a nice win this week of 13-10 to 10 over at Triton, uh, kind of in dramatic fashion, too. I know it was a Triton took the lead with about three and a half minutes left, and uh, then Manchester Essex scored on the very first play, kind of a busted coverage, uh, 80 yards from – uh, Will Lewandowski to, to receive a Sam Rice. And uh, Sam Rice is a great story. Uh, you know, he played football as a freshman, uh, badly injured his collarbone and didn't play football. Again, he's played golf his junior, you know, sophomore, junior and senior seasons. And he only played football this year because it was in fall too. He, he still played golf uh, in the fall and, and he comes out, he's kind of, you know, in their rotation in their defensive backfield and in, in their backfield, and he caught the 80 odd touchdown. Uh, so, you know, good story for Sam Rice coming back to the sport and, you know, giving them their first win. Sorry about that boys. I, uh, 
no VPN now. Our VPN from work is down and my Wi Fi is crashed here. So I guess I just timed out. Um, I don't know where we left off. I was just talking about the run game, but Nikhil Walker. Nikhil. My guy, Nikhil, pretty good hoopster, average double double this year. You know, he's a big body, but yeah, I just wanted to give a shout out to him. He's been playing terrific both sides of the ball, come up with some huge tackles. Uh, I think he batted a couple passes down against North Reading and. On the other side of the ball, he just uh, he just moves bodies, you know, opens up holes and, and knows where to be. So Ipswich is, is looking good to start here. Um, Willie, I, I know you saw our Essex Tech. I'm not sure if you guys touched upon them while I was uh, lost internet here, but talk a little bit about them. They got a big comeback win this past weekend, and I thought they had looked pretty good in the first game too. Yeah, they're putting points on the board. You know, Northeast and uh, Greater Lawrence are traditionally Essex Tech's two toughest opponents. So they got those two out of the way and played really well against uh, Northeast and then came back to beat the Reggies. So good for them. They got some really good players on offense. Uh, you know, Jace Dooley on the outside, uh, Dylan LeBron throwing a ball to him, uh, both sophomores. So these are two guys that are going to combine for a lot of points and a lot of yards over the next, uh, you know, two and a half years. And uh, I want to know, say I, Dooley's gone over a hundred yards receiving in both games, right, guys? I believe that's right. Did in the first yeah. game, yeah. So yeah. yeah. So that's um, you know, that good things, good things going for the for the for the Hawks. And I can tell you, Coach Connors, Dan Connors over there, he he said something similar to Nick, and and he just said to me after the game, you know, Matt, uh, I'm so excited about the pieces that we have. You know, that's they're they're going to be a good team next year and the year after for sure. Not that they won't be this year, but uh, that's a team to watch uh, as far as the statewide playoffs in the lower divisions. Uh, they're building something over there really, really well. And starting three sophomores on the offensive line, too. I think, you know, this is a team that we talked about a few weeks ago that we thought maybe some sophomores would be better than usual because they're, you know, six months older. And I think Essex, Texas is one of those teams that's really benefiting from having those sophomores in the weight room. You know, uh, Coach Connors is a great strength coach, has a great, you know, staff in place for off-season conditioning and stuff. And, you know, having those kids kind of in that program for three months before they even play, uh, you know, they, they got some really strong uh, boys out there contributing at a young age. Well, when you say uh, next season, it's funny, like next season is – you know, less than six months. I mean, six months from now, it'll be getting ready for the third week of the 2021 season proper. Six right. weeks from six weeks from now, Phil. Come on. Yeah, it certainly <laughs> seems that way. Um, so, yeah, I'm really interested to see, like, what the carryover effect will be. Not not by any stretch to dismiss any of the seniors who are playing this year. I'm, I'm psyched for them that they're getting a chance to play their final season of high school football, but – I'm really curious to see what the juniors and sophomores in this uh, fall two season can do to carry over their play into the actual regularly scheduled fall season. Um, you know, can they keep the momentum going? Is it going to be enough time in between seasons to, to keep that motor going kind of thing? I mean, all these kind of unknowns, but it's really fascinating to see what we've seen so far from some of these young guys and knowing that uh, quite a few of them will be back playing again this fall. Not only that, but, um, you know, kids that are playing that play other fall sports, are they going to make the switch? Did they like football that much that they're going to stick with it? Or are they going to go back to, you know, soccer or whatever they're playing in the fall? So that'll be interesting to see, too. Yeah. Let me uh, save the last couple of minutes here for Nick to uh, Nick G to talk a little hoops if he wants to on a, on, on a variety of different things. But anything right, else? <laughs> Well, we can start with my bracket. But, but, but before track. anything, any other any other football comments before we do that, though? Anything else anybody want to mention on football? The Patriots signed any of you guys uh, since we talked last week? No, nah, not me. Oh. No. no. Okay. Cooks no. looks like he could play, though, right? They have enough slow white guys. I don't need another one. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Maybe maybe we should have just gone right to Nick Giannino right away. I, whatever. So, Nick, here we go. Uh, March Madness and uh, other basketball. What can you share sure, with us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I still got Gonzaga just like, you know, the rest of the country. So, I'm riding them to the promised land. I think they're playing right now as we speak. But I uh, still got them winning it all. The rest of my bracket crashed. There's just been so many upsets. I don't think anyone could have predicted this. Weird season. Um 
you know, the rankings were tough and just been a lot of upsets. It's been fun in that regard, but tough if you, you filled out a bracket. Um, so I'll ride with Gonzaga there, but did get a chance to go over to the Celtics on um, Sunday afternoon against the Magic. They got a much needed win. I think Jalen Brown hit 10 threes, which was uh, good to see. One short of Marcus Smart's record, believe it or not, with the Celts. So I don't know. I'm not taking too much from it. I think uh, they still got a long way to go. You know, it's good to get a win and convincing one at that. But they're, uh, you know, approaching the trade deadline here. And we're just going to see if they, they make some sort of move. Because the cost that they got right now, they're not going anywhere. I'm sorry. It's just not. Um, but I did get the chance to speak with uh, one Mike. Carter Williams, I haven't got a chance to talk about him in a while. He's kind of been um, doing his thing in, in Orlando, you know, ever since he signed there two years ago, it looked like he might be out of the league and he kind of found a home in Orlando. They seem to like him there and he's been starting for them uh, past 14 games or so. So that's good. They've had a ton of injuries. It's a tough situation there. You know, it's, this is a playoff team from the past two years that just can't catch a break in terms of injuries this year. And now there's news that, one of their studs, Aaron Gordon, wants out. So we'll see what comes of that. But looks like Carter Williams will be there to stay. He's starting to produce, uh, you know, across the board and really riding that defense. He, he provides a lot of energy for the team. So it's good to catch up with him. Obviously, his uh, his brother is still in the tournament. They'll be playing um, today, Monday, as we record this against uh, Ohio. So uh, if they can get this one, they'll have to face Gonzaga in the next round. But Zagorowski, again, just had a um, terrific year, you know, AP honorable mention player, junior now. So we'll see if he decides to, you know, go forward and enter the draft or come back for a senior year. I'm not sure where he's leaning in that regard, but. All-American yeah, so that's what I got. Right? What's that? All-American honorable mention. Second straight year. Yeah, right? what I say? Yeah, AP All-American honorable mention. Second yeah. straight. Um, he's their best player, you know, he plays pretty much every minute, so. Take a look at Creighton if you're watching the tournament. They're, they're a fun team to watch, and if they can win on Monday. They'll have a, a likely with Gonzaga, unless they get up. Yeah. Why are they playing tournament games Monday? I thought it was always like Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Yeah, they changed it this year. They they, they started it a, a day later. They started on Friday, and they're just doing Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. I'm not sure why, um, but that's what we got. So the Sweet 16 will be set by the time everyone listens to this. You know, you know, as the senior member of this group, there are very seldom times where I don't feel really old, but watching Bobby Huggins and Jim Beheim coach against one another on the week on Sunday, like, man, how, who are these? They're still around these two guys, huh? Man. Yeah. yeah. Beheim's Huggins. Huggins is kid. I had no idea. Yeah. Yeah. Huggins just got his 900th win before losing to the Cuse. So he's been there a while. Well, he's been at other. He's been Cincinnati years ago, I guess. Right. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So whatever. Anything what else, Jeff? To, uh, Bill, speaking of you uh, being a Vermont guy, what happened to the uh, the star for the Catamounts there that the Celtics drafted uh, a while back? What's his name? Poppin Smith. Whatever happened to him? I, Taylor Coppenrath. <laughs> Who? Taylor Coppenrath. I remember him. Coppenrath. Oh, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He fizzled out. Carmelo for... Anthony, I believe. Uh, not Carmelo Anthony. They beat Syracuse the year after Carmelo Anthony left. Yeah. Okay. Right. Wow. Yeah, that's right. They went, what, Elite Eight or something? No. Yeah, I I don't know what happened to him. You know, it's uh, I, don't, I don't get a lot of news out of Vermont, out of the Catamount basketball program. Every once in a while, they do make the uh, NCAA tournament, but it's been yeah. a while, you know, so. Uh, yeah, the coach retired, and I think that was that. I can't remember Brennan. the guy's name. It was like Tom, I mean, I want to say Tom Bergeron, but obviously. Brennan, that's Brennan, oh, Tom Brennan. Ah, okay. Uh, let's see. TJ Sorrentino, uh, I'm sorry, Tyler Copenrath, his number has been retired by the uh, University of Vermont, according to Wikipedia. All the uh, English teachers watching out there do not uh, judge us for using Wikipedia here. Uh, it's an approved source. It's a reliable uh, source. He, he played <laughs> one summer league with the Celtics in 2005. See? I knew uh, that. He made his way to Europe and had uh, an okay career. He, he played almost for 10 seasons over there at various... Uh, Various locales looks like the Italian Serie A, and um, then then over to Spain, which I think is like the top league in uh, Europe. Uh, 
you know, Liga ACB, it looks like. Uh, he signed uh, his last team was the Ferd Burgos, not, not to be uh, confused with the Ford Bronco or with uh, former Danvers high grade Eric Burgos. So I don't know how we got on this, but, uh, you know, here we are. Maybe now a roadie for fish or something. Who knows, you know? <laughs> but hey, fun, fun fact. Tur I Tur had uh, tickets when um, Carmelo Anthony was a freshman at Syracuse. I had tickets to that, that package of first round games at the Garden that Syracuse was part of. And they won the national championship that year. And I saw the two first round games in Boston that he played with. Um, who was the little point guard they had there? Was it McNamara, Jerry McNamara? Oh, yeah. He was lights and, out. Yeah, so I saw Syracuse play their first two games before they went on to win the uh, the Natty, as you hoop heads call it. Uh, and that was, what, 2003, I want to say? Yeah, Ooh, he was right. drafted in 03. So, uh, yeah, 2003. And I don't even want to know how old you were, Nick, then. So don't tell me. No, I won't. <laughs> He does it. He I does was old it. enough to watch, put it that way. I was <laughs> nice. Reaching up high to get the TV knob. Yeah, yeah. there you go. I'm yeah. guessing you were younger than some of my kids, so that would depress me if I knew that. So don't tell me. Okay. Hey, our, our time is up, but great research, Matt Williams. Terrific job. And gentlemen, great seeing you again, and we'll talk again soon. Sounds good, Bill. Yeah. Hey, boys.